June of 1, 2004, and it's the Civil Morial interview. Okay, thank you. Is uh, I'm going to be looking at my question. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. You get my side of my face. Well, you know, I can scoot around right over like this. I want to reach. And how about these doors? Yeah. You want them closed or open? Um, I think they're okay. Yeah. yeah. As you probably know, this is the Board of Regents grant that was given to the History Department at the University of New Orleans to, uh, for several reasons. Uh, we had wanted to, um, to go further in depth in current contemporary New Orleans history. We thought we had a great opportunity uh, with the new technology to interview um, the people associated with a certain a particular time period and uh, find out how to use that to help our students and help our, our History Department collect information. Um, we are, are, because of Dr. Hirsch's work, very interested in the Royal mayoralty, and um, we chose this as our topic. Um, as we went into the subject and interviewed people, we've become more and more interested in that first election, uh, from the Voter Rights Act until the election of New Orleans' first black mayor, and how that happened. Um, so we've had a series of wonderful conversations with people involved in that period, and of course you would be integral to that period. We wanted to talk to you today about that. Um, Dr. Hirsch will ask you some uh, questions and we'll just have a conversation about it, and, and Eric and I will ask maybe some things later on in the period. So Dr. Hirsch. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, do you recall uh, when it was that uh, Dutch first broached the idea of running for mayor? Let's see. It, it must have been about 1964, which was when the um, public accommodations bill was passed, and then next year when the voter, voting rights um, bill was passed. And uh, he looked at the dem demographics in the city and saw that um, the second ward was not quite majority black, but very close to it. And he thought that that might be an area where a black could win. I don't know whether he was considering it himself at, at, at the outset when he discovered this, but I guess for the next um, year or so, um, he began to think about running for, for that office for the state legislature himself. But the decision then to make the initial race for the state legislature was taken with the thought that the... Excuse me, I'm sorry. Can you just repeat that question, Dr. Harrison? Okay. My problem. Thank you. Uh, was the decision to run for the state legislature taken with the notion in mind that the mayor's office might be down the road? Not at all, because uh, as he mentioned, I guess, later on in his career, uh, when someone from the press asked if he, if as a child he looked at politics and thought of becoming mayor, he said that wasn't even a dream of a, an African-American boy then. And he, his, his thinking was, uh, take care of the, the task at hand, and then whatever evolves, you address that at that time. So I don't think that he had that in mind then. Um, he he wanted to win that race, and um, he went all out in campaigning to win that race. So the state legislative victory was an opportunistic sort of occurrence. Yes, and I, I you know it was a, it was a breakthrough for African Americans. I mean he he had the um, I guess the desire to uh, knock down barriers he had started back in his college days, and this was just another challenge for him. Do you recall when it was his horizons began to expand, that once in the state legislature he began to see that if this were possible, something bigger might be? Well, yes, from there he went on to the juvenile court uh, as a judge, and from there to the appellate court, the state appellate court, and then on to the mayor's race. Uh, I don't think he had a long-range plan for that. As he said, he, he attacked the, the task at hand and kept all his options open. And as 
uh, th things evolved and looked good, he moved on to the next challenge. Now his first judicial position, I believe, was an appointed? It was appointed, yes, by uh, then Governor John McKithen. Do you remember any of the circumstances surrounding that or how that came to be? Well, he had been in the legislature for three years and uh, it, it had taken its toll on his practice, uh, his law practice, because it was a part-time thing and they weren't paid like they were these days. And um, we had, you know, we had a lot of children and so he was looking for uh, a more solid income. And I think that was one of the motivating factors. And then too, I think that that particular court appealed to him because he, he loved children. He was fabulous with children. And uh, he saw that, that the judiciary in that court did not understand some of the challenges that m many African American uh, children faced. And of course, those were many of the cases. And so he, he took on that position with, with uh, gusto, you know, he was going to enlighten the judges and, and probably bring some changes about legislatively. He in fact behaved a little non-traditionally yes. as a judge. Yes, he did. And he was very much involved uh, with um, some of the advocacy groups in the city for young people. When he ran for his next judicial office, did he have the uh, beginnings at that point in time of gathering together a campaign organization or group where this was still an individualist? I, I think it may have been in the back of his mind, but I think it was way recessed. And um, he went to the appellate court because I think he he wanted to be intellectually challenged, and that would present that opportunity. But I felt that it would not satisfy him knowing how, uh, what an activist he was and what a, an agent for change he was, that this was not where he wanted to spend the rest of his career. I, uh, I expressed that only once, and he uh, ignored my comments. <laughs> Um, but he, he took on that position too with, um, you know, with, and, and gave it his all. But then I think, you know, maybe after a year or so he began looking at the mayor's race and he was looking at the demographics again and there were more, since the Voting Rights Act, there were more African Americans registered to vote, still not a majority. Um, and so the wheels began to turn and is this the time when uh, an African American could win. And he never took on a challenge that there was not a possibility that he could win. I mean, he didn't just jump in and, um, you know, with the intent that uh, I'm going to lose this race, but I want to make a statement. I think he always felt he, he, there was a chance he could win. Now, this would have been the early 1970s. Well, let's see, he, he was in the uh, uh, juvenile court from 1970 to 73, and in the Louisiana Court of Appeals from 73 to 77 when he ran for mayor. Now, at the same time, there are any number of other young, aspiring black political figures on the scene forming organizations and pursuing their own ambitions. Uh, did Dutch see himself as being a part of that movement, or was he somewhat uh, more individualistic in his political pursuits? He was very much indiv individualistic. He, he wanted to bring about consensus, but he knew that wasn't possible, and um, there were jealousies among the political groups. His political organization, LIFE, which was founded when he ran for the state legislature, was dormant uh, during his uh, years on the bench. And then he, um, you know, he brought it back to life when he ran for mayor. But he, wh when he made that step, I, I don't know many people, even friends, who thought he had a chance for several reasons. The city was not a majority black, not that he could get all the black folk. 
but also there were three candidates in the race that had gotten who 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 held public office who had gotten black support and uh, there were loyalties there that um, he knew that you know he didn't have a crack at but he decided he was going to give it his all and he jumped in and he ran despite the naysayers and it was very difficult to raise money because not many people wanted to invest in someone that they thought couldn't win. And it was our friends who uh, contributed small amounts, like $50. Um, we did it on a shoestring, you know, with... What was, uh, when he decided to, to make that race, uh, what role did you play in uh either in the organization that evolved out of the campaign or in the campaign itself? Well, I was um, sort of the fundraiser, fundraising chair. Um, we had a lot of little small fundraisers, and we had one large one, and we were uh, going to people that we, that, that we didn't even have relationships with, but as the as the campaign went on and as he presented his, his uh, platform, uh, people began to listen to him because it, it made sense and it appealed to them. So we had some people who came in, into our camp and there were others who contributed as they contributed to others. Um, so he was selling his, himself and, and being successful at it. Now you had been active yourself both uh, in your own right and in his career, either as a plaintiff in some court cases or as uh, a member of the League of Women Voters, I believe. Mm -hmm. did, well, did any of those earlier activities and ties uh, play into the, uh, the mayoral campaign or, or help you along? Oh, absolutely. They, they um, gave me experience and, and a confidence to do some of the things. I had never been involved in a political campaign except uh, his campaign in the legislature, and um, and that was, uh, you know, we we had we we just sort of felt our way and instinctively did things that turned out to be uh, that turned out to work uh, for us. But um, as far as the uh, the my challenge to the uh, state law that forbade teachers to belong to organizations that advocated integration. I was the plaintiff in that suit. When, it, when the schools were integrated, the legislature passed a number of laws to hold back blacks, and one of them was that blacks could not belong to uh, organizations that advocated integration, and that one was the NACP. And Dutch had been very active in the NACP, the local branch. He was pr a president of the local branch. Uh, for several years before he went into the U.S. Attorney's Office. So we challenged that law, knowing that there was a risk that I could be fired. But we felt that it had to be challenged, and we, we won. Uh, in 1963, even before uh, Dutch ran for the state legislature, I organized a group of women, the Louisiana League of Good Government, because we had tried to, uh, it was a small group of us, eight of us, eight women, to join the League of Women Voters. And of course, they weren't allowing blacks in that group. And so we talked about it and decided that we had an agenda that the League of Women Voters did not have, that we were interested in getting our people registered to vote, and we were interested in educating ourselves on uh, political issues. And so, I was a founder. We organized in 1963. We were a nonpartisan organization, and we did several things. Where we spent most of our effort was getting people registered to vote, and then it was a big challenge because you had to pass a citizenship test and a literacy test, and you had to provide certain uh, documentation, and they would switch on you. So it was going to, we targeted four areas in the city. Um, three of them were in housing projects and went to, went to those places every week and 
discuss the importance of voting and having your voice heard and also preparing them by presenting the materials and so forth and encouraging them to go. So that was before the Voting Rights Act. We did that until, well, we, we continue to do it even more recently, but um, that was good experience for me. And I had made friends in those areas. And that was before Dutch was going to, uh, was thinking about running for public office. Um, and I'll tell you how it came about. We were, this group, we were the, it was called the Sicoso, and we were doing, it was uh, social, cultural, and civic uh, d things we were doing. And one of the young women, we were young in our 20s and 30s, said, oh, there's an election coming. I have to talk to my husband about who to vote for. And it, it hit a nerve. I, I said, what? Well, he's out there and he knows the ev everything that's going on and so forth. I said, well, it shouldn't be. We, we need to know ourselves. We need to make our own decisions. We need to, get, to help them in some instances. So um, that was the beginning of, of the Louisiana League of Good Government. And um, that did prepare me for his uh, race in the legislature because for that race, I organized a phone bank. And I didn't know anything about organizing a phone bank, but I knew that you had to get names of the people who lived in the district, and you had to get people to call, and you had to have a, a, a script. And so we did it. You know, it was sort of instinctively feeling your way. You learned the nuts and bolts of the political process. Yeah, it's one of the important things that has to be done. And, and scheduling him to go to the churches and to even the bars. There were a lot of bars in that district, and he would uh, visit all of them. Was there very much concern in the uh, run-up towards the mayoral race with making connections in the white community politically, uh, or was there a conscious strategy to emphasize his base of support in the black community in the primary that had so many candidates? No, he was going after every vote he could get. I mean, he was a he was a candidate that. Um, while he knew that his base of support was in the African-American community, uh, he knew he had to get white votes to win. And of course he had made friends, and I had made friends through organizations that we both belonged to who knew us. And so, you know, we went after them for support, uh, and we did get enough support to win. Now running from a judicial seat is not always the most advantageous place to run no. from. And in fact, there were some difficulties, weren't there, with the law? Yes. And, and the lawsuit that, that, that hampered the right. campaign in the beginning. And again, there was the threat that he would be, he would have to leave the bench, and we had five children, and we had two in college, and so, you know, should we take that risk, and was it worth it? And we decided to take the risk, and. Um, I don't know, it was fortuitous or providential that uh, when the case went, the case, the, the suit was to have, that he had to resign from a judicial seat to run for a political office. And um, it, it, when it went before the Court of Appeal, they sat on it for about six months. Which, you know, I, I, I don't know why they did it. I've got, um, I couldn't believe that they did it because they were favorable toward him, uh, you know, staying in a salary position while he ran for, for, for the office. But it, it wasn't until 10 days before the election that they declared that he had to resign. So we could be hungry for 10 days, you know. <laughs> um, but that, and, and it was so funny. Um, his advisors and so forth. I was at work at Save University and they called me and asked if I could come right away and I said, oh goodness, what's happened? And they strategized about how to convince me to uh, let him stay in the race. But when I got there, I mean, it was, it was, why would we back out then? I mean, <laughs> there, was, there wasn't even discussion. You know, he, he says, well, should I go on? I said, sure, go on. It was just 10 more days. So he went on. And the assembly of the legal team that handled that suit 
involved with a lot of people who were also young attorneys just yes. now, either became either part of this campaign organization or political figures in their own right later on. Absolutely. I mean, we, uh, in the end, we all band together. But you know, there was the problem with the political organizations that had declared that they were not going to support Dutch. And, uh, and that was one reason why he couldn't raise money, because they said, well, if you can't get uh, your base of support from the African Americans, you're not going to win. And he says, I'm going to go directly to the people. I'm not going to go through an organization. And so he went to the people, through churches and through organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> of the people that uh, signed on to the campaign at that time. Uh, oh, wait, I got a cough. <coughs> Jacques, can you get me some water, please? Uh, <coughs> I believe David Marcello came on. Oh, David was, you know, David was his uh, legislative aide. David is like a son to Dutch and me. He had just come out of uh, law school. I don't even know if he, he may have still been in law school. He went to Williams. But he was Dutch's legislative aide from 60, uh, 68 to 71. And he was, you know, he was a lead attorney on that. And uh, wasn't it through that lawsuit that Dutch made his first acquaintance with Bill Jefferson? Right. Right. Bill had just come from, he had done a, a stint with uh, Senator Benny Johnston. And um, he had just come down here and began to practice law. And Thank you. The great thing about this technology is you just cut what you don't want, huh? <laughs> Trevor Bryan, who was in Jefferson's, well, who, who was Jefferson's firm, and David Marcello. There were others, but those were two primary attorneys. Was Sidney Bach involved in this suit? He was involved with Dutch and some earlier activities. I don't know that it was in this suit, but I'll tell you another thing that was providential. When this case went before the Civil District Court, it went to Fred Cassabri's court. Now, he, Fred, uh, Fred Cassabri, now a federal judge, was on the city council. So he had political sensitivities. It was a perfect judge that would be favorable to us because he understood the politics of it. And um, of course, he ruled in our favor, but they took it to the appellate court. So a, a lot of uh, the stars and <laughs> lined up in our favor in so many ways. And how did uh, Dutch react uh, in private moments or public moments when the spoiler tag was attached to his candidacy? And oh, he just he, uh, would dismiss it. Oh, he totally ignored that. You know, he said they don't know what they do, and they they don't know what they they don't know the situation. Yeah. And. No. The pundit's analysis. Maybe, I mean, maybe deep down, but he, you know, he, you know how Dutch was. He was just so self-confident and, you know, he went on with his plan. Who did he listen to? Um, he listened to a lot of people, not any one person. I mean, he would, he would listen and take from them what he thought was valuable. And he listened to me and he listened to his sons, you know, even though they were young. They, they had political instincts also because they had, during the Civil Rights era, they had, you know, gone to churches with him and, and viewed the boycott of Canal Street and all of that. It was the boys that, were, that liked to be with him in those situations. So they sort of grew into a political sophistication he had honed, Dutch has, had honed his political skills in a number of offices, not electoral in the mainstream society. Not political at uh, all. He was, the African -American community. He was uh, of course, uh, very active in the NACP and went to their national conventions. 
he was active in the Knights of Peter Clave and went to their national conventions. And he was very active in his fraternity, his service fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha, and went to their conventions. And he said, there's nothing like the politics in a black national organization. <laughs> so he learned a lot through his active activity in those organizations. So for the white commentators or observers seeing him, from their point of view, come out of the blue, they it thought really it wasn't the blue. I mean, he had been working they didn't know he had had. Fields for a long time. They didn't know he had that experience or that level of sophistication. Um, other than fundraising, and it's a big other than. Uh, what were the the biggest problems that confronted the campaign? Well, it's it's convincing the people not to listen to a political organization, but to listen to his message. And. Um, he was successful in that. And he was successful in uniting the black people because, you know, they in, in this city there had been differences of the Creoles, the black Creoles, and the American uh, Negroes. I mean, it was, you know, this was very subtle, but... Right, the phrase hadn't been used in, in some time, perhaps, but the, the differences were there. And they, they tried to divide. They said he was too white to be black and too black to be white. And he went to them and said, that's the way we've been divided. And unless we unite, we all will benefit if we all get together. We are all Negroes and let us come together as one. Did he ever voice any particular view of the traditional brand of New Orleans politics, the uh, patron-client, first between white leaders and black? subordinates who were to gather up the votes in the wake of the attack? Well, no, he, he recognized the value in that early, in, in the early days. For example, this was before he, he became active in politics. He, um, A.L. Davis was, was president of the OPPVL, and Chink Henry was president of the ILA. And blacks would have gotten nothing if it hadn't been for those leaders who negotiated with the white politicians to get some benefits for black people. So, so they were useful in their time. Well, it's interesting that you raise uh, A.L. Davis and Chink Henry and their organizations because they had been around for a long time. That's right. And there were a lot of newer organizations just on the scene since the passage of the Voting Rights Act, such right. as Soul and Coup. That's right. And those did Dutch see a difference, or was there a difference either in the leadership, the quality uh, of the leadership, or the kinds of demands coming forth from these newer as opposed to the older groups? Well, the point here was that those groups had to go to the leader. He says, I'm going to be the leader. So that was a difference. You know, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't need a, a, a black agent to go to the white mayor and, and say, that, you know, this is what is needed. He would represent the black people outright, and the white people. Uh, if I just give you a couple of names and maybe give me uh, your own reaction to them and, and Dutch's as well, that might be useful mm -hmm. in the context of this early campaign. Uh, Sherman Copeland and so on. They wouldn't endorse him, so he ignored them. You know, he went directly to the people. He didn't see them as being essentially uh, key players or felt he could work around them? They wouldn't. They had already committed to other candidates. They had already committed to Nat Kiefer, who was in the state senate and who had been supportive of that organization in the past. So besides um, them wanting to have their own little power base. Uh, it was loyalty to someone who had been in their corner. Yeah. Hank Braden. Coup. With Coup, the same thing. They, they did not uh, endorse him. I think that Coup endorsed Toni Morrison. And um, they just said outright, you, know, you can't win, we're not going to endorse you. The Deshwas in Louisiana Weekly. Well, they weren't, and, well, yeah, Henry was, because they didn't think he could win. 
I mean, it, that, it, was, it was as simple as that. I wa they wanted to be with winners. Some of them weren't, you know, dedicated to uh, what he had to offer, or his philosophy, or his plans. Moon, Moon um, well, he supported Moon when Moon ran for mayor. Um, again, Moon, they didn't think he could win. That was the bottom line. You can't win. We've got white candidates who have black support. They're eroding your, your base, so you can't win. It was uh, not that easy to think outside that particular box. And yeah. was the only one, apparently. Who did, and, and who, went, who forged forward. Do you think he took it personally? Or did he see it as a pragmatic choice that these organizations or individuals were making? He understood what they were doing. But yes, he did take it personally because he, you know, he felt that, uh, you know, this was a chance for a breakthrough and um, they didn't want to risk, uh, you know, losing. Did he, if, even if they had supported him, do you think he would have uh, worked with him very much? Oh, he would have been obligated to. Yeah, I think he would have. I, you know, he, he would have been obligated. Do you think he thought that the, the black community needed that level of... Um, that middle, that middle yeah. man? Yeah. Not if you could be there. Yeah. I was wondering if he would have... I don't know how he would would have used them, but he would have he would have had to uh, honor their loyalty in some way. Because it was it he didn't have to. He didn't have to, yeah. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Which would have made him more of a free agent once he got into office. Exactly. He didn't owe anything to to anybody. Him. That was. I mean, when he went into office, he was. He had no obligations. I mean, no real political obligations. I had a question. Um, we talked to some people who were talking about the, uh, when, why did people who supported Roy all the time, who said um, these were in the white neighborhoods of town, they said that he was uh, more for people who were supporting neighborhoods. Uh, they used that a lot. They mentioned your name and said, we didn't really know Morial. We really weren't involved in the civil rights struggle. But he felt he would be a supporter of neighborhoods. What do you think they meant by that? I'm not sure what they meant. He had been, you know, he had been all over the place in the city, you know, and supporting many issues uh, that were not political, that were for the betterment of, of the community. And it probably, as I w w became acquainted with neighborhood groups and um, and I, I think it was as simple as that, that, that he had known them through various organizations and activities that, that uh, he was involved in. And, and one of the things, I was active in the arts. I was in, with the Children's Arts Council and uh, some other organizations. And so those people who, who knew me came to know Dutch. So it, it, I was sort of a stepping stone to his, to his uh, activities. And that makes it easy to, you know, to at least listen. And I think he was, look, I think he was, he was a bright man who, who, who was a great planner and who had, who had great visions for the city. I mean, he wasn't an ordinary run of the mill that was going to, uh, you know, just move things along. He, he had uh, plans. 
In terms of the campaign itself and uh, the organization that involved on uh, it, could you describe the get out the vote end of that campaign? What was done to organize to make sure that uh, your people were first when we talked about registration already, but that those people that were registered got the message and came out on election day? Well, the churches were very important in getting to the people, and he um, he visited many, many churches throughout his campaign, five and six on a Sunday, each Sunday. And, and some of the, some of the get out the vote groups emerged from the churches and from, uh, from his supporters. And it was, you know, we had in each ward, we had to have a get out the vote team. Uh, in addition to the telephone. I mean, it was just a, a mass planning to, to make this happen uh, with a lot of people involved. These were volunteers? volunteers. All volunteers. Volunteers who went, you know, into the neighborhoods and passed out materials mm. before the election, you know, several weekends before the election, and again on election day standing, uh, you know, so many feet away from the polling places, again, talking to the people as they walked up. So you get the organization working up to the election and through the and election? And through Election Day. Mm -hmm. It became more sophisticated in his second run, but it was just mass organization of lots of people. Another big thing was yard signs had come into their own during that time. and. Um, I remember uh, Mark was in charge of the yard signs, and by, you didn't go to the sign place and buy your nice styrofoam signs all printed. You had to have them printed, you had to have plywood on, with, with wallpaper paste, put, put the uh, thing on the plywood. Then you had to organize people who had trucks who would go to the places and, and and then you had your telephone people who were taking orders for signs. So that was a very intricate deal that, that you know, that required a lot of organizing and a, a number of people. So all of these things, were, it, it really reached a level of, of um, high organization on many fronts, on the phone, but you didn't have, the, you didn't have a professional phone bank like you can get today. I mean, you had to have your own phone back. So you had to use offices, law offices and so forth, that had, you know, six or eight or ten phones and assign your people to go in and, and call in the evening after they got home from work. So uh, there was so many things going on. And then you had your fundraiser where you called people, you sent the, the thing out, you sent the invitation out, and you called them to ask them if they were coming. And then when you were, if the things were slow, the responses were slow getting back, he called again. So it was, it was um, a lot of tension, a lot of activity, and you know, many things going on. This was uh, every night of the week? You would have something to Oh yeah, yeah, we, at the headquarters at the old, at the old uh, Peter Claver building. Uh, th that from uh, seven in the morning until almost midnight every day. Oh yeah, campaign. yes we, we did. Small cash. Right, not not a lot of cash at all. No, and you know we, I guess, in the past the white candidates had had paid some of the street workers uh, to you know to pass out them inf material, and we we just didn't have it. Our people were enthusiastic about um, the race, and m money was not required. We didn't have it to give. As the campaign progressed, uh, if you recall, what did Dutch think of the other candidates, the, the pressures that they made on them, whether it was Matt Hufer, Tony Morrison, Joe DeRosa? Well, I think he felt that he was as uh, uh, capable as they were, if not more capable than some of them. And, you know, there were debates, uh, or there were probably just one or two debates on television, uh, and he he did very well. He, he scared him. <laughs> was 
it important for Dutch to get on TV to show that he was as capable as anybody else? It was. It was. Conversation, it, discuss issues. It was critical for him to get on TV, not so much in ads, but in the debates, where they could compare. And uh, comparing uh, Dutch's erudition in that context uh, didn't hurt him. Not at all. You know, he was quick on the draw. Were there any surprises in the campaign? Either um, good or bad? I guess that's sort of muted in my memory. <laughs> um, you know, the build up, and, you know, I guess deep in my gut, I thought we were going to win, and I, this was not based on any any measured uh, observation. I, and I think many people who were involved in the race, it was just this, you know, we're getting there, we're going to get there. I think that was, that, that is what made the momentum. Was there a Go sense on. when you got Joe DeRosa in the runoff? Oh yeah, that was, a, that that was good. <laughs> You know, when on, on election night, Nat Kiefer was declared uh, the winner. And that would have been a problem because he did have a lot of black support. But when they counted the votes, he and Joe DeRosa were so close, and Joe DeRosa was the victor. That was very good for us. Because at least we could mo at least we could, uh, we, we could, we knew that we had our base. Right. As well. Yes. Uh, so again, the stars came together. They lined up. Yeah, I don't want to. Oh, I just had one last question. It had nothing to do with the seventy-seven or seventy-eight campaign. Oh. I remember speaking with Dutch many times in uh, eighty-eight. In '89, when he was toying with the idea of, of coming back and running for mayor again, and had the big, big press conference at the Fairmont, finally announcing that he would not do it. Uh, did he have? What were the clearest reasons he had for not making that race at that time? Do you know? I think he ultimately realized you can't go back. You needed to go forward. He would have been looking for another challenge. He yeah, wasn't. As I, as I recall, and you can correct my memory if I'm wrong, as I recall, there wasn't much question as to whether he would win if he decided to make that right. race. Right, right. But the question I had for him was, what would you hope to A accomplish? accomplish, having been there? Well, you know, I think Maynard Jackson was a two-term mayor, and then he sat out, and then he came back. And it was not the same challenge. I mean, he was a fabulous mayor uh, of Atlanta. And when he came back, it, it, first of all, he didn't have the enthusiasm that he had in the past. And it was kind of old hat. And I think Dutch looked at that. It's also the Reagan era. Yeah, not good. And not a, cities were not in good shape. Were right. The and weren't getting any money. Right. No money from the federal government. So it was, I, I think he would have moved on to something else. What was the name of the suit that you took part in? Um, you know what, I can't even remember. It may have been uh, Sybil Morial versus um, Whatever that law was, so. the state of Louisiana. But nobody. They're not enforceable. Not yeah. Enforced, but they're still nobody ever wiped them out, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Mm, my pleasure.